Idioms are these strange things we say that don't usually make sense on their own, but when applied to a context, they have some meaning. Some of them sound sensible, while others are absurd and their meanings unguessable. Knowing the backstories of some of these idioms will give you a better appreciation of them, and will clarify how they came to exist in the first place. Why would a cat have gotten my tongue? And why the heck are fish in kettles? Stick around to find out. This is Word Nerd, and I'm your host, Adam Webb. Let's start with Pardon My French. Pardon My French, or Excuse My French, is used when we want to apologize, sometimes in advance, for using obscene language. This phrase dates back to the 19th century and was actually used literally when people would regularly inject French words and phrases into their English conversations. Throwing in these words and phrases indicated that you were a learned and cultured intellectual. Also, some phrases in French just have no perfect translation to English that is quite as precise or elegant. French, it seems, has a certain je ne sais quoi, a unique quality that cannot be described and that certainly cannot be translated. Idiom 2. Donkey's years. Donkey's years means a long time, and so if someone has been playing chess for donkey's years, then they're probably very good at chess. This phrase traces back to the early 20th century and is a pun on donkey's ears. Since donkeys have long ears, then according to the pun, it has long years as well. Number 3. Cat got your tongue? This question is usually asked to a person who is speechless. While today the cat may seem an arbitrary animal to steal one's tongue, back in ancient Egypt, those who lied and blasphemed had their tongues cut off and fed to the cats. And much more recently, the British Army and Royal Navy used a whip called the Cato Nine Tails for flogging. This whip had nine tails and may or may not have anything to do with the nine lives that cats are rumored to have. So painful was the beating from this whip that the victims would be rendered silent for a long time. The name of this infamous whip dates back to the late 1680s, and so the idiom has come a long and painful way. Number 4. Bite the bullet. This phrase means to accept or push through something difficult or unpleasant. But what could be more difficult than biting down on a bullet to distract yourself from the pain of battlefield surgery? where the only anesthesia is the hope of going back to see your wife and mother. This reality is the beginning of this idiom that dates back to the 1890s. Number 5. Basket case. If a thing or person is considered useless or hopeless, then they may be called a basket case. This one originally referred to soldiers who lost their limbs in battle. The limbs of the decapitated soldiers would arrive at hospitals in baskets. However, many believe that this rumor from 1919 was not true and said the baskets never actually existed. Either way, this idiom very much exists. And number six is break the ice. Breaking the ice simply means starting a friendship with a stranger or making the first move to reconnect with someone. It can also just mean a conversation starter or warm-up activity to engage students or meeting members. However, a few centuries ago, this was a very literal phrase. Ships, the only means by which countries could trade with one another, would sometimes get stuck in ice in wintertime. The country to which goods were bound, as an act of partnership and of course as a means of ensuring the arrival of their goods, would send smaller vessels out to sea to break the ice and clear the path. Number 7. To butter someone up. This one means to flatter someone in order to get them on your side or to buy their friendship. Back then, it wasn't just people, but gods who were buttered up. In ancient India, religious people, in a sort of delicious ceremony, would throw balls of butter at the statues of the gods to keep their favor and forgiveness. Number 8 is barking up the wrong tree. If you think literally, then you can probably guess the origins of this one. To bark up the wrong tree means to follow a false lead, or to be misguided in a situation, wasting your time going down a road that leads to a dead end. It dates back to the early 1800s, when it was popular to hunt with packs of dogs. These hunting dogs would spot a prey in a treetop, but even when that prey had escaped, the dogs, not realizing, would continue to bark, and therefore would be barking up the wrong tree. Number 9. Turn a blind eye. If you are ignoring an undesirable situation, 
Maybe because you would rather not deal with it than returning a blind eye. In other words, you see it, but you don't. Behind this idiomatic cowardice is a story of great bravery. The British naval hero Admiral Horatio Nelson had one blind eye. During the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801, the more cautious Admiral Sir Hyde Parker and the overall commander of the army sent a signal to Horatio to halt his attack on the fleet of Danish ships. Horatio put the telescope to his blind eye and looked to where the signal was. And then he told his men that he did not see the signal to withdraw. Of course he didn't see it, he was using his blind eye, which obviously couldn't see anything. Horatio and his men pushed toward the attack and won. After the battle, he was immediately promoted to commander-in-chief for his brave and winning act of defiance. I wonder if that promotion would have instead been a beheading if the battle had been lost. Number 10. Caught red-handed. This means to be caught in the very act of doing something wrong. It comes from an English law that stipulated that someone could be punished for killing an animal that wasn't theirs, but only if they were caught with the animal's blood still on their hands. Number 11. Bury the hatchet. This one means to stop a conflict and to make peace with someone. Back when the Puritans were at odds with the Native Americans, when negotiating peace, they would literally bury the weapons. And this was the way to actually seal the deal and make the treaty valid. Number 12. Let the cat out of the bag. This means to reveal a secret, probably by accident. In the 1700s, one of the most common street scams was cats in bags, but sold as pigs, which were much more valuable and of course, much more expensive. Of course, the scam would come to light once the cat was out of the bag. Hopefully for the scammer, he would by then be nowhere in sight. Number 13, spill the beans. This one, like letting the cat out of the bag, means to reveal a secret. This phrase originated in ancient Greece, where people would cast secret votes by putting white or black beans in a jar. The white bean was a yes and the black bean was a no. If someone accidentally or deliberately knocked over the jar, the beans would be spilled and the results of the votes, or at least the results up until that point, would have been prematurely revealed. Number 14, hands down. This means effortlessly or by far. So if I beat you in a game hands down, it means you had no chance. It also probably means that the game is Scrabble or Mario Kart 64 or Super Smash Bros. This one comes from 19th century horse racing, when a jockey who was leagues ahead of everyone else could afford to remove his hands from the reins and still win the race. Talk about a show off. Number 15, fly off the handle. If you fly off the handle, then you become suddenly enraged. It's a really good piece of imagery, but back in the 1800s, it was possibly deadly. Poorly made axes would from time to time dislodge themselves from the handle mid-swing, perhaps leading to an unintended decapitation. Number 16. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is one of those rarer idioms. As you might be able to guess, it means be careful not to discard something useful in the process of discarding something useless. Or don't accidentally eliminate good things in the elimination of bad things. So if you are planting a garden and you are doing some weeding, be careful not to also uproot the flowers or crops that you are planting. This one goes all the way back to the 1500s when the entire family would use the same bathwater. In other words, 21st century Japan. There was a hierarchy for the bathing sequence starting with the men and ending with the babies. By the time the babies would get their turn, the water was so dirty that the baby could really, literally get lost in there. There was a real risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater at the end of the bathing process. Number 17. Pull out all the stops. This one means to make every possible effort to make something you do successful. This saying dates back to the 1860s. It alludes to the organ, that instrument that sounds like an Anglican church. The organ had things called stops in it. By pulling them all out, all of the keys could sound at once, making for a very loud and jarring noise, and the least angelic chord that one can play. Number 18. Riding Shotgun. This one dates back to the 1900 Wild Wild West, when the guard who rode alongside the stagecoach driver was equipped with and always ready to use a shotgun. Now, the term simply means driving in the front passenger seat, even if there's no shotgun involved. Number 19. Mad as a Hatter. This fun one is used to refer to someone who's acting crazily, or of course, someone who is clinically insane. While your mind might shift back to Johnny Depp's brilliant character as the Hatter in Alice in Wonderland, this idiom goes much, much further back. 
In the 19th century, felt hats became extremely popular. The hat makers or hatters had to remove fur from the skin of small animals to make the felt. Mercury nitrate was used in this process of deferring. During the process, the mercury nitrate would release a gas that would inadvertently be inhaled by the hatter. This gas could cause mercury poisoning, a symptom of which was behavioral changes that would cause the poisonee to appear mad. Now, mercury poisoning is commonly called the mad hatter disease. Number 20. A different kettle of fish. When A is incomparably different from B, and in most cases worse or more extreme than B, we may say that A is a different kettle of fish from B. Related yet different is the idiom fine kettle of fish, which sarcastically and with brilliant imagery describes an awkward or messy situation. To understand either idiom, let's travel back to 18th century England, when fish kettles, kettles used to poach fish, were commonly used. In some areas, it was a traditional politeness to poach fishes in these kettles, which were actually oval-shaped saucepans, and give them to guests. This act was called giving a kettle of fish. The custom was described by Thomas Newt in his Tour of England and Scotland in 1785. He said, It is customary for the gentlemen who live near the Tweed to entertain their neighbors and friends with a fed champetra, which they called giving a kettle of fish. Tents or marquees are pitched near the flowery banks of the river. A fire is kindled and live salmon thrown into the boiling kettles. Somewhere across the decades, the idiom shifted from pretty to different kettle of fish, and now the former is almost completely phased out. It is proposed that the common idiom, a whole different ball game, influenced the change from pretty to different, first corrupting and then entirely transforming the idiom's form and meaning. And number 21, kick the bucket. One of the most common idioms for death, this one is the blunter version of saying pass away. It actually came from the practice of using a bucket to hoist oneself up above the ground so that a suicide could work. The suicider would stand on the bucket and slip the noose around their neck. Then, when ready, they would kick the bucket out of the way and hang freely until they hanged. Now, suicide or not, kicking the bucket means dying. And on that deadly note, I will leave you until next time. Thanks for watching.